All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Black Boston and Politicking's Boston Mayoral Candidate Forum. We're so happy to have you all here. My name is Jordan Wilson. I'm the co-founder of Politicking and super excited. Um, I want to remark that this is one of the most diverse uh, races that we've ever been involved in, politicking as a political information platform that seeks to engage traditionally disenfranchised voters. And so with that, it's so good to be a part of this moment in history. I'll pass the mic over briefly to my co-founder, Winkuni Siant, and of course, to our partnering organization, the lovely Black Boston. Thank you for that, Jordan. Um, we're super excited to have you guys with us today. Many of many of you guys we've spoken to individually, but we thought this was a remarkable opportunity to get you guys together. And we really want to focus in on the issues that are at the heart of the Boston community. So we're very, very excited and super honored to work with our, um, our co-sponsors, um, the Black Boston. And we're going to just turn it over to you guys to introduce yourselves as well. Thank you both Jordan and Wen Kuni for allowing us to collaborate. Hi everyone, my name is Alexandria Noah. I'm the Director of Political Advocacy at Black Boston and I'm also here with Rebecca Maranco who's also representing the political advocacy team. Um, and Black Boston began last May and May 31st to be exact in reaction to police violence against our brothers and sisters, um, particularly George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And now Black Boston has now expanded to support Black Bostonians um, in various ways, such as political advocacy. And as polit political advocates at Black Boston, our mission is to empower youth to be politically engaged and share their opinions with those that can make change within their communities. And we also find it imperative to inform the community about issues that impact us. And as a result, hold our elected officials accountable, which is why, which is why we are here today. So thank you, um, jo um, Jordan and Winkuni for um, allowing us to collaborate. And thank you to, um, the candidates here. On another note for housekeeping, I want to remind folks, um, if you already have come with questions, that's great. Uh, please keep those log. And if you'd like, you can start putting those in the Q&A. If you'd like to ask questions towards the end of the program, uh, we'd be happy for that as well. We also want to remind you to check out the policy guide that we shared beforehand, although it certainly doesn't encompass everything that our candidates today may talk about. It certainly does give you an idea of where everyone stands on really important issues. Um, and so with that, uh, it's my understanding that Mayor Janey is popping in in a moment. Uh, ladies, if you like to offer anything else to housekeeping, uh, you're welcome to, and we'll start our formal Q&A in a moment. Yeah, I just wanna offer one thing about the, the policy guide, just to, um reiterate that it's a growing document. So we'll, we will have a final one that will include um, more of the policies and the missions that you all have. So um, bear with us with that. And as we're waiting, I also want to extend a welcome to Mr. Sean Ellis, who is also participating in today's panel. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Black Boston. Thank you, Polit Politic and, uh, and all the candidates um, who are involved in the race for, you know, being president for having me. Sean, if you don't mind, although we had you um, scheduled to say a little bit more about your background, if you could just give us, um, you know, a brief look into what you've been working on recently, that'd be great because uh, this, the highlight of this conversation is to focus on how candidates look to improve the lives of black voters in Boston. It'd be great if you could speak to where you stand on that today. So I'll just give a little bit of my history. Um, my name is Sean K. Ellis. Um, I, I'm born and raised in Boston. I've been a Bostonian my whole entire life. At the age of 19, um, I was arrest I was arrested and wrongfully convicted uh, for the murder of a Boston police police officer, officer John Mulligan. Um, as a result of that conviction, I spent 20 approximately 22 years of my life incarcerated. Um, the majority of time, which I spent at maximum security prison, although my, my my behavior was pretty much stellar while I was inside prison, um, and 
um, my attorney and I engaged in a protracted fight um, to 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 uncover um, information that was being withheld um, by um, elements within the Boston Police Department. Um, I don't take and 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 won't ever say that all police officers um, are bad. You know, there is a need for policing, um, but. When I say elements, I'm speaking about elements that um, go about their job um, in an unprofessional and rogue way. And so um, that is what I have been um, a victim and am a survivor of um, having to, to, to push back against that sort of culture. Um, and, and, and I believe that ingrained within that culture um, of corruption within the Boston Police Department is, you know, is racism. Um, at its at its at its core, and it's something that I believe that we that we as citizens um, of this Commonwealth have have a responsibility to address, whether or not we're running for 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 elected office um, or are just the average citizen, um, the quality of life um, of our lives and the life of our neighbors matter, and so um, it's, it's it's something that um, I'm glad that we're here uh, speaking about in the general in a general way and, and, and that you know some questions are fashioned around and so um that's pretty much um my backdrop what i've been doing since i've been home is is some community organizing and working with uh different organizations to to address a a a, a epidemic that's not really being spoken about which which is the 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 failure of the criminal legal system um and wrongful convictions not just within the commonwealth um, Massachusetts, but really all, all over the nation. But our focus here today is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, and particularly uh, the city of Boston. Yeah, Sean. And we just can't wait to hear a question a little bit later in the program, but I want to move us right along. So excited uh, to hear from our current mayor, Mayor Kim Janey. I won't take up any of her time introducing herself nor her moderator's time and asking her questions. So with no further ado, please, Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, and I just caught the tail end of Mr. Ellis. So I just wanted to thank you for serving on my transition uh, committee. I'm really excited to be here as the first black mayor and the first woman mayor for the city of Boston, uh, leading our city uh, at a time such as this, making sure that we are meeting the moment um, in terms of this movement uh, for black lives and just grateful for those who have uh, put this conversation uh, together. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Janie. And I'm excited to ask you our first and sort of leading question that's framing today's forum. Um, looking at Boston, between the devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the continuous protests against police violence and systemic racism, events of the past year have truly illuminated structural inequities in, that have existed in Boston and beyond. As mayor, what are you doing and will continue to do to protect and uplift the lives of Black Bostonians and other communities that have suffered most from these inequities? Thank you so much. Um, and I, I'm grateful and to my parents uh, who raised me. They came of age during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, uh, taught me a lot as a young girl uh, to make sure that I had uh, information around uh, not only what was happening, but a, around black leaders, not just in our city, but across the country and world so that I would be deeply grounded and, and proud of who I was as a little girl. Uh, the community that raised me, you know, I saw activism like Mel King. Um, the racism that you speak of obviously was 400 years uh, in the making. It is why we have seen disproportionate impact uh, in the Black community in terms of COVID-19 uh, with confirmed cases and certainly uh, with deaths, uh, as well as the Latinx community. Uh, it is really important that we do all we can to address structural racism uh, and these policies, uh, the discriminatory policies, whether uh, through legislative bodies, whether through our courts, um, have led us here over the course of the last 400 years. And so I have hit the ground ready, running. Uh, obviously this is not uh, something that you can solve in just a few months in terms of structural racism that has been in the making for 400 years, which is why I have decided to uh, run for a full term 
Um, this is also something that is not solved by one individual, but we have to ensure that there are folks who join us at decision-making tables, making sure uh, that those who are most impacted by policies, whether it be policing, whether it be education, whether it be housing, have a seat at the table. Uh, and we have already begun to address many of the disparities that we see in Boston and many of the uh, inequities through um, the work that I've done just in the last four weeks as mayor. Thank you so much for that, Mayor Janie. I'm actually gonna pass it over to Sean to ask you his question on criminal justice. Thank you, Gwen. Um, and um, I just, you know, as a just disclaimer, um, you know, have to express that I, I personally haven't um, endorsed any candidate. I believe in fairness, um, and so um, to those who are listening, it's very important to to pay close attention. Um, you know, be, because the information you hear should serve as 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 the basis of your decision. Um, but my first question. Um, is that in the net the the Netflix docu series trial trial four? It is clear uh, that there was a systemic failure within the Boston Police Department, which resulted in key evidence uh, being withheld, um, thus forcing my attorney and I to engage in a protracted struggle uh, to obtain documents. What checks and balances uh, will you put in place to ensure? that the public has access to documents that exist within the anti-corruption division um, of the Boston Police Department, which wasn't specifically mentioned in the OPEC audience, um, ordinance. Thank you uh, for that. So we, we do have to uh, ensure that there is accountability and transparency, which is why uh, the OPEC ordinance was uh, created uh, why I have invested a million dollars in terms of staffing that work. Uh, beyond that, uh, it is important that these files um, that, that are released to the public uh, during the time uh, that you mentioned in terms of trial four, uh, we saw a lot of corruption. Uh, we saw, you know, someone accused of sexually, sexual uh, molestation of children uh, during that si same time period. Um, I have called for the release uh, of that file, as well as a full investigation in terms of how that case was handled by the police. There were a number of police officers who knew, um, and this particular officer was able to remain on the force, rise through the ranks uh, in uh, the uh, police union, um, and retire with full pension. And so there is definitely a culture within our police force um, that needs to be looked at. And beyond this specific case, a calling for the release and file of other files and a full investigation for any kind of police misconduct, particularly when it relates to uh, sexual misconduct, uh, sexual assault, uh, abusing children, uh, we need to look at also the unsolved murder rate, uh, which is very high. Uh, we have to do a much better job at, uh, you know, reimagining how policing works in our city. This is all happening in the context of the Chauvin trial that is unfolding and will uh, most likely, uh, you know, closing arguments are happening next week. Also comes in the wake of uh, the murder of Dante Wright. Uh, certainly uh, the murder of, you know, a 13-year-old boy, and this is very personal to me. I have a 13-year-old grandson. I have a 17-year-old grandson, uh, and I fear for them, and I fear for our girls as well. Thank you, Mayor. Rebecca Moronko of Black Boston will continue her questioning for a few more moments. Thank you. Yeah, our next question is focused more on uh, the pandemic, which is ever evolving. Um, as mayor, what is your current number one priority? And if elected for a full term, what will be your number one priority in Boston's path to recovering from the pandemic? Well, it's important to note uh, that COVID-19, uh, certainly, as I said earlier, is disproportionately impacting uh, Black and Latinx 
uh, communities. And it is doing that because of pre-existing inequities, uh, whether we're looking at health, you know, housing, um, so many things. There is a life expectancy gap from Grove Hall to Symphony Hall of 30 years. Um, so we have to uh, ensure that we are not just battling the pandemic, uh, but all of these underlying issues. In terms of the pandemic, I am leading uh, the city uh, through a recovery, reopening and renewal with a laser-like focus on ensuring that vaccines are getting to communities that are disproportionately impacted to vulnerable uh, communities. The mobile vaccination clinics and priority clinics have been an important part of that strategy so that we are meeting residents where uh, we are. We also launched the HOPE campaign so that information is getting out and uh, the native language of the diverse residents that live in our city um, in terms of any uh, hesitancy of the vaccine or you know, just wanting uh, clearer information and knowing where to go to get that information. It is so important that we ensure that there is equitable access to the vaccine uh, as well as confidence in it so that we can uh, uh, get businesses fully operating, make sure that uh, workers are getting back to work, that our children uh, can be back in school fully with their teachers, with their friends. Um, and so it is really important that we continue to battle uh, this pandemic, but that we also lift up and, and attack uh, all of the underlying issues that uh, this pandemic has laid bare. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question, I think. Um, you touched on a couple of your priorities to ensure health equity for Black Bostonians. I wanna give you the opportunity to expand on that, um, but then also if you wanna to touch on looking at an equitable education system for the city of Boston, since I know most of your answer also covered health equities to the past question. Uh, thank you so much. And so when it comes to the inequities, we see it playing out in a number of ways, certainly uh, Black maternal health, um, the high rates of diabetes, heart disease, asthma in, in the Black community. Um, and we have to battle all of those things. And that is in part why we see the disproportionate impact in terms of COVID. Uh, when it comes to education, uh, very proud that I come from uh, a family of educators. My father started his career in Boston Public Schools as a reading teacher, um, moved on to become a, a principal. Uh, and then left BPS to become a superintendent of three major urban school districts. Uh, my mom has also taught, my stepmom has also taught, my sister currently teaches. I've dedicated my career to education, advocacy, uh, working on policies to eliminate the opportunity and achievement gap. My very first experience in school was at a community school that was organized by the black community and the Jewish community because uh, BPS was not educating Black children. This is way back when, uh, in the early 1970s, uh, when I was in kindergarten uh, and first grade. I did enter uh, Boston Public Schools. I experienced busing in middle school uh, during the desegregation era and eventually graduated from uh, a METCO program school. And you could see the difference uh, in terms of what uh, you know, MECO kids had access to um, as compared to uh, kids in Boston public schools. And that is why, you know, I did dedicated my career uh, in my advocacy uh, to ensuring that there is equity and excellence in education, particularly for those uh, who have been left out, uh, whose parents are often not at the decision making tables. Uh, and there is a lot of work that we still need to do around teacher diversity, around diversity in our exam schools. Very glad to see uh, the courts uphold the decision uh, that BPS took last year to suspend the test for one year. Um, you know, I'm very proud of the work that I've done to dismantle or to try to dismantle the school to prison pipeline through a state law that was passed uh, years ago, uh, through my work at Massachusetts Advocates for Children uh, brought this advocacy to the council and now uh, to the mayor's office, uh, where we need to ensure that kids um, have every opportunity to succeed, uh, particularly when we have world-class uh, 
you know, colleges and universities in Boston that many of our, our children uh, don't have access to. So there uh, still remains a lot of work uh, on that front, but really proud of, of uh, what my parents and, and my uh, family have instilled in me in terms of the importance of uh, fighting for black and brown kids in, in Boston. Thank you so much, Mayor Janey. I wanna give you the opportunity for any closing remarks before we move on to the next candidate. Um, I would just say uh, that I'm really grateful uh, to join uh, this dialogue. Uh, it is really important that we not be afraid to center black people uh, when tackling uh, racism uh, in our city, to lift up black people, to call out racism uh, when we see it. And it shows up everywhere. Uh, our workplace, the doctor's office, uh, in our schools, uh, you know, out in our parks, we see how it plays out when it comes to violence in some neighborhoods. Um, we see it everywhere. And so it is important that we meet this moment, uh, that we not shy away. Um, that is the work that I've already started as mayor, um, the first black mayor, the first woman mayor, uh, just in these last four weeks and look forward to continuing to lead uh, the city of Boston through a lens of equity, justice, and love. As someone who has experienced many of these issues, whether housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, you know, teen pregnancy, uh, domestic violence, really important that I bring this lived experience to the mayor's office uh, and lead in a way where we are centering racial equity and racial justice uh, in our city. And I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, with all of you uh, this afternoon. I will uh, have to step away uh, if you are uh, finished with me, uh, but I do appreciate the opportunity. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Mayor Janey. Uh, it was great to hear from you. And thank you to our wonderful moderator, Rebecca. I wanna move right along to uh, Councillor Michelle Wu. She has wonderful things to share about her candidacy and we'd love to give her this time in moderating the discussion with her will be my co-founder, Wankuni. So please, ladies. Thank you for that, Jordan. And thank you, Mayor Janey. Um, so excited to be with you, Michelle. I don't wanna cut into your time. So I will give you the opportunity to first introduce yourself uh, before we jump into the questions. Good, is it afternoon? Okay, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. I'm so, so excited and, and honored to be with you all. This, I believe, this is the first time that all of us candidates are together, right? Uh, so this is quite um, an exciting day and, and I'm, I'm so honored to be part of this moment in Boston's history in this field. Um, I'm someone who never ever thought that I would run for office growing up as a daughter of immigrants. Um, I'm the oldest kid and my parents didn't speak English for a long time. And so it was always a sense of barriers it got more intense um, in my early 20s when I became primary caregiver to my mom when she began to struggle with um, serious mental illness and raise my sisters. And so the city of Boston has really given my family and me everything that we cherish in our life, uh, the ability to, to have raised my sisters with schools and, and to see them grow and, and turn into amazing young women, um, to have my mom living with me today and much stabilized after some amazing um, healthcare and lots and lots of follow-up and, and patients and community um, and to have a home where we can all be together. Uh, but I know what it's like to be staying up all night in those emergency rooms, praying for a mental health bed to open up or fighting for services in schools or trying to open a small business. And um, this is a moment right now for us to really think big about how to how close all those gaps. And uh, I'm so excited that we're um, getting to to come directly in community and make sure that everybody is realizing um, the importance of getting engaged early and how much this moment means for, for Boston for generations to come. Thank you so much for that, Councillor Wu. I'll jump right into it. So how do you seek to ensure that the issue of environmental injustice in the city is made a priority? When we think about the impacts that we've lived through over this last year, right? The tremendous sense of trauma and loss and economic devastation, public health devastation. All of the crises that we've seen COVID and this pandemic deepen and expose were present in communities at crisis level for a long time before this virus ever came. And one of these underlying crises is 
exposure to environmental pollution, exposure to the burdens of climate change, the flooding, the heat, the um, that poor air quality, which exacerbates so much of the, the public health issues that we were just talking about earlier. And so Boston needs to lead the way. I'm proud to be the first um, in the country to put together a, a city level Green New Deal, really emphasizing that climate justice is racial and economic justice. We have to take steps to fight and mitigate our climate vulnerability that line up with eliminating poverty and building community and empowering democratization in our of our decision making. And so um, there's a lot that the city can do on this front, but most of all, it's about following the lead and centering environmental justice communities, black, brown, immigrant communities who have been bearing the burden of this pandemic are also the first to be living near environmental hazards, to be exposed to air pollution and so many of these long-term impacts. So we can really dig in, make sure that we are not just talking about the levels of our oceans, you know, 100 years from now, but how Morrissey Boulevard already floods every every couple months or so, and that makes it impossible for for people to to get around, and it exacerbates mold in in homes, and the the families who can't afford the mitigation of this are are then stuck while the rest of the city is is gentrifying around, and so this is environmental justice is tied to housing justice to our equitable small business recovery, to public health in every way. Um, and we need to lead with centering racial equity as the driving force in our decision-making. Thank you for that, Councillor Wu. I'm gonna pass it over to Sean Ellis for the criminal justice question. How you doing, Michelle? It's good to see you. Um, I'm well, thank you. Um, and it's the same question, I just repeat it. Uh, in the Netflix docuseries, Trial 4, there is, it is clear that there was a systemic failure within the Boston Police Department, which resulted in key evidence being, being withheld, thus forcing my attorney and I to engage in a protracted struggle to obtain documents. What checks and balances will you put in place to ensure that the public has access to documents that exist with, within the anti-corruption division of the Boston Police Department, which wasn't specifically men mentioned in the old Pat audience. I will do everything in the power of city government to make sure that we are moving forward with accountability. I just wanna name that um, this conversation is coming at a really intense time, right? We have seen this pandemic stop a lot of things Right, people stopped flying on airplanes. So many of our businesses shut down. Our economy kind of froze for a minute. But what hasn't stopped is the injustices that we see, particularly through the criminal legal system, particularly through our uh, systems that are designed to, uh, in name, be creating safety. But actually, one after another after another, we are still seeing these injustices play out. And it's it's piling all on top of each other. It is enraging. It's it's demoralizing, it's deeply re-traumatizing. Most of all, what I want us to take from it is that this anger, we can't let this anger turn into hopelessness about the system and our ability to change it. We have to turn it into action. And so the incredible persistence and just fight that, that you and, and the community have, um, have put in to highlight what the injustices that happened in your case the, the news that we're seeing now of um, a, a head of the, the police union with so much buried uh, there that was unconscionable, documented by multiple state agencies. These are cases that have come to public attention, but there are so many that have not, right? That we know, um, we, we don't know about. And so there has to be transparency as a baseline. We have to change the rules and make sure that in the next police contract, in the governing legislation that this agency and this department has to follow, transparency is what must come first. We have to reimagine our systems so that we're not just trying to catch the bad things that are happening and, and make sure we're, we're actually taking care of it uh, because there's a lot of things that won't rise to the surface. It has to be a cultural change all the way top to bottom and making sure that we are um, reimagining and restructuring what is happening. I've put forward some uh, proposals in terms of 
how we are thinking about crisis response, shifting responsibilities away from armed law enforcement to have a public health led response. I've been proud of my track record and making sure that we're um, taking action to ban racist technology that the Boston police were, were potentially about to use in, in face surveillance and to, to sponsor the companion legislation for that, that would have community oversight into surveillance technology that the city would be adopting that's still moving forward through our, our processes. Um, but the big picture is that we need to be a city where building trust is the be all end all. And that requires reimagining and restructuring so much of what's happening in, in the systems that are unjust today. Thank you for that, Councillor Wu. As mayor, what would you set as the number one priority in Boston's path to recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic? So there's, there's so much uh, that is at crisis level right now from public health and small businesses and families getting food on the table and, and being able to rebuild our lives. Um, the top priority for me is making sure that we are not taking this moment and turning it into band-aids on long-standing challenges, right? We're going to get, some, we're going to get a lot of funding in this next moment from the federal government pitching in from supports to, to rebuild and recover that cannot go to putting band-aids. The priority has to be recognizing racism as a public health crisis. And so even at the point where we're past COVID as the immediate public health emergency, we are still acting with the same level of urgency, the same sense that we're gonna tackle this crisis head on. It is pervasive through all of our systems and from the contracting that the city is doing where at this moment in time, it was 1.2% of city spending billions of dollars going to black and Latinx owned businesses to our educational access and the, the likelihood that students living in, in communities of color and black and brown communities have access to quality schools and, and to, to get those seats in the lottery to our uh, development system. How, who's making money in our city and how, do we, um, how are we setting the rules? All of these big picture systems, the ways that we, in which we touch people's lives, schools, health and wealth, we have to be tackling it with the same sense of urgency that racism is a public health crisis. Thank you for that, Councillor Wu. Um, my last question for you will be kind of tied into everything you mentioned. So between the devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, the continuous protest against police violence and systemic racism, events of the past year have truly illum illuminated structural inequities in Boston and beyond. As mayor, what will you do to protect and uplift the lives of Black Bostonians Asian Bostonians and other communities that have suffered most from these structural inequities. So again, it just, it's, I, I want to name how much um, individuals are feeling in this moment and that it's really important for us to have spaces like this to be able to create spaces for healing and for conversation that can translate into action. Um, I'm, I'm proud of my track record in making sure that even before COVID-19 and the pandemic has deepened and exposed so much of the structural racism in our systems that I've been fighting, taking on the big challenges to make sure we were delivering change from legislation that required supplier diversity and accountability for how we were spending our dollars and investing in minority owned businesses uh, from legislation to ensure that we were keeping rents down as much as possible when a, a company like Airbnb was driving up housing prices and threatening to sue us, taking that fight on. And from making sure that the, the public health and the access that people have to a safe, clean, healthy environment, that, that, is, that we're taking action at the scale that we deserve um, of delivering a sourcing of renewable energy higher than, than we've ever had before, even though people, again, told us it was impossible. We have to be acting to tackle these structural inequities for a system of safety and health that truly keeps everyone safe. Educational equity and the most rigorous world-class opportunities for all of our kids and creating an economy that's fair, where we're closing the racial wealth gap so that Boston isn't one of the most unequal cities anywhere in the country. We have all we need to do this. We have the resources, we have the activism, we have the ideas. We just need to be bold and do more in this moment. And so most of all, I wanna make sure we're acting with a sense of urgency to keep going and to aim for where we actually need to head. 
Thank you so much, Councillor Wu. Would you like to leave us with any closing statements before we move on? Uh, just so much gratitude for, for you all, for all that you do um, day in and day out. I'm really excited to be with both of the hosting organizations and just um, thank you so much, Mr. Ellis, again, for um, everything that you're, you're doing for our city. Um, I guess all I will leave in reminding folks is that this is a level of government. Obviously, maybe all of us are biased because we are in the thick of city government. I think this is the level that matters the most to people's day-to-day -day lives. And yet, when you look at the turnout in elections, right? Think of the number of people who come out to vote for president and governor, cut that in half. And then even less than that is usually who turns out to vote for mayor when it matters in so many ways. And so every single voice is huge, especially when it comes to the city level. So most of all, um, I'm so excited that we're seeing organizing all across the city. Thank you so much for giving us the chance uh, to, to connect with everyone and looking forward to seeing you all um, very respectfully and humbly ask for your vote. Thank you so much for that, Councillor Wu, and we're looking forward to continuing to chat with you. Now we're going to move. Oops, sorry. Now we're going to move on to Sean Ellis. Um, Sean already briefly introduced himself, but Sean, I'll give you another opportunity to briefly just tell everyone a little bit about yourself. And I would ask that you um, illustrate where you are currently in your trial. I know we spoke on Monday about a wealth of things, but I want the people to know where you are now. Where I am now in terms of what? In terms of the charges that have been dismissed against you and the charges that you're still combating in 2021. Okay, thank you. Um, and so because I have um, started already sharing, um, I'll continue on, um, which is really what is situated um, at the heart of my questions, along with the work that I do with the New England Innocent Project, um, the work that I do with the Innocent Program of CPCS, the Boston College Innocent Program, there are very, uh, there are various innocent programs that exist throughout throughout New England that I'm part of and attached to, and so that's all inherent. But um, for those who don't know, uh, for those who haven't seen Trial Four, I encourage you to watch it. It's a docu series on Netflix. Um, which really speaks about a a a standing twenty eight plus year uh, struggle that um, I've had uh, with the Boston Police Department and the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office of that time um, to clear my name of a wrongful conviction. Um, I spent approximately twenty two years in prison uh, for a crime that I didn't commit. I was nineteen years old at the time of my arrest. I was in my early. 40s um, by the time that I came home and missed so much. Um, but at the heart of, 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 of my struggle, at the heart of our struggle, um, has been um, a wealth of, of, of corruption and cover up um, that emanated um, from the Boston Police Department um, and, 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 and was in, inherited um, by the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office under the leadership of, uh, at the time, Ralph Martin, um, his, you know, Dan Connolly, who came after him, and then the acting uh, district attorney, uh, John Pappas. Um, you know, the people that I just named um, was well aware of, or should have been aware of, all the documents, um, all of the evidence that existed that had not been turned over to my attorneys and I, and so, as a result of that evidence not being turned over, I spent 22 years of a life sentence, a sentence which means that I was um, supposed to die in prison. Um, I spent 22 years of it incarcerated. And so um, where I am at in terms of the litigation um, in 2015, Judge Carol Ball uh, overturned the conviction saying that um, I had not received a fair trial and that justice had not been served. Um, that was brought up to the seven members of the state's highest court, the Supreme Judicial Court. Um, and the seven members of the SJC also found um, that justice was not done and that I had not uh, received a fair trial. They went a step further and spoke to the, the connection um, of, 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 of the victim in this case, um, Detective John Mulligan, uh, they spoke to his involve his involvement and my learning um, of his involvement, which was part of the evidence that was withheld 
um, and concealed and, and to be quite frank, covered up, um, they call that a complete game changer. Um, and, and, and following, following that decision um, in 2018, um, acting, acting district attorney, uh, John Pap Pappas dismissed uh, the, the murder and robbery charges uh, that I was facing. And um, that left um, two fire um, possessing char charges on my record. Um, and, and, and I was in, and I am innocent of those as well. So we filed a motion with the Suffolk County, um, the, the Suffolk County Superior Court. Um, and, and the current district attorney, Rachel Rollins, um, having received the motion, having done her, her investigation and her due diligence assented to uh, the rule 30 that was filed by my attorneys and I, and right now, um, it is before a Suffolk County Superior Court Judge Judge Allman, um, who 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 is slated to at some point, you know, ho hopefully soon, make a decision um, as far as 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 as, as um, the, the new trial. Um, but what I can say is that um, there are no there are no material facts. Uh, there are no facts in this case. Um, you know the, the 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 homicide charges and the armed robbery charge charges are already dealt with, um, and so when I'm speaking of, there is no material fact in dispute um, between the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office um, and my attorneys and I, and 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 so we're hopeful that that Judge Allman, um, you know, signs on to to uh, the motion so that I can go forward uh, with a free criminal record. I don't have any any criminal charges on my criminal record. I didn't prior to uh, my encounter with, 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 with this situation. And that's how I would like to live out the remainder of my life, um, having no, no, no criminal charges on my record. And so that's where things stand up. Thank you so much for that, Sean. And I think it's just such a testament to who you are as a human being um, and your tenacity in this fight. I want to hear how has having this remaining um, firearms charge affected your life? Does it impede you from getting certain types of work? Are there certain places you're not able to be in? Um, I know we spoke on Monday about you having to wear the GPS on your ankle. Um, I know you're no longer having to do that, but how do how do these gun charges basically affect your quality of life now? Well, I mean, um, <laughs> I, 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 I sit right now on this panel, um, co-moderating this panel as a convicted felon um, for, 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 for something that I'm innocent of. And so I can speak to you as far as the 22 years that I spent inside of prison, un, unable to work, unable to build up a resume, so on, like, like unable to start to work towards retirement and everything that I would be working towards. Um, I came home in my mid forties and had to enter into the, the, the workforce um, at an entry level as, as a 40 year old, as a middle-aged man, if that's what we can, I don't call it a middle age, but um, you're, you're going to, you're going to stand. So I'm, I'm, I'm so far back um, as I move forward um, and, 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 and try to supplement my income doing uh, inspirational, motivational speaking, um, there are some places that I can't go as a result of having um, this blemish um, on my criminal record, which should not be there. Um, I, I, I love children. Uh, I grew up playing pop one of football. I would, I would love to entertain the idea of possibly um, coaching some, 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 some minor league football. But if I have a criminal record, I have to figure out like, how did that impact my, not just my work life, but what I would want to do, um, you know, in terms of volunteering my time to young people, um, to keep young people away from the, 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 the criminal legal system and, and, and try to college or, 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 or counsel with them. Um, and, and so it's, it's definitely imp impacted my life in a way that most couldn't even imagine. Um, you, you know, as uh, I want to be a dad um, and, 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 and imagine, imagine my child having to be confronted with the notion that, well, yeah, your dad is an ex-felon. Like, I don't, I don't want that when I haven't earned that. Like, I'm, I'm, I, I shouldn't be an ex-felon. And, and, and so it's a, it's a problem. Um, what happened to me 
um, systematically is a problem. And, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that, you know, as we push forward, um, that the problems that I experienced can be addressed um, in a rudiment, a rudimentary way, in a fundamental way. And so. Thank I'll you for saying. Thank you so much for that, Sean. Um, kind of as a closing remark, we, ha we have you here. It's an unprecedented opportunity to really directly address the mayoral candidates on some things that you would like to, to really see change. And I know you've had the opportunity to ask some questions, but I wanna give you the opportunity to speak on, you know, if there's anything that you could say to these mayoral candidates who are vying at this very important seat um, in, in a city that we see has some issues with the criminal justice system. Um, what what exactly would you want them to know? So um, I'll say two things. One is I had two questions. I wanted to be fair and go through each candidate with the first question and then circle back with the second question. I do have a hard stop. Um, and so I will I will say two things and then I will coach, you know, conversation. I will coach my question in terms of remarks. Um, but you know, the first thing that I would want to say is that, um, and I think Rachel Rollins um, in her election is evidence of it, that, that I know and understand that um, the police department has a union that is very powerful. Um, and, you know, there's something that should be done, there's things that should be done to address the power of the police union. However, uh, with that said, um, you, you don't need the backing of the police union to win an, an election so long as you know you're in a community that 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 is most affected by the injustice uh, which makes up the majority um then then like you don't you don't need the backing of the police union to win an, an election just be about what you say you're about and you get to where you want to be um and so I'll say that the, the 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 second thing that I'll say comes in terms of in terms of the question um and the creation of OPAC um uh, which you know I've had an opportunity to read through the audience and, and I'm familiar with policies and regulations and things of that na nature from my time at uh, MCI Norfolk um and, and I haven't dealt with OPAC in a way that I intend to but I will say this that that um there is a need um, at some point for whoever um, whoever's election is successful to 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 entertain um, whether quarterly meetings with the director with the executive directors of the New England Anson project, project project in the Committee of Public Health Council Service, Services and these innocent programs that exist throughout the Commonwealth. There's a need. For, for 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 the mayor um to, to sit with, with with some of if not all of these heads um and, and engage in dialogue with regards to 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 any any issues that that that, that might arise out of the creation of OPEC. Um, um there are some things that OPEC could possibly do or not do that could affect the work that's done by these innocent programs, which which is based on and geared towards the missions geared towards getting wrong wrongfully convicted people out of prison, um, which 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 isn't a, a, a easy thing to do, um, and, and and to the extent that there is an entity, an OPAT that kind of has the ability to foster um, transparency and accountability, um, one would ask why not meet. With the people who 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 inherently, because our our criminal legal system is an adversarial one, why not be willing to meet with with all parties who are affected, um, or all all parties who are stakeholders, um, uh, within this criminal legal system, um, and, and 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 so what I would ask of each candidate is to be willing and to make a commitment, um, to be willing to meet. With these these people, or the doesn't need to address whatever issues may arise out of out of its creation. Thank you so much, Sean. Before you go, do you mind telling everyone here how we can stay in contact with you, how we can support and uplift you? Um, absolutely. Um, you can visit my, my website if you want to get in touch. Um, trial four trial f o u r dot com. 
Um, I'm on social media. Um, my Instagram is LSK Sean. My Facebook um, is Sean Kareem. And my Facebook page is Sean K. Ellis. Um, but definitely, definitely um, um, you can support by buying the merch, Wounded But Not Broken. Wounded But Not Broken is not just is not is 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 not just being wounded by the criminal legal system, but you know there is. I have a belief. I have a personal belief that we all, as human beings, go through things, um, and and some of those things that we go through can beat us down so 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 much that it wounds our spirit. That that sometimes we may even feel like we can't go on any further. But to the degree that that we continue to push forward. To the degree that we continue to press against the the, the, the systems and the, the nuances and the oppression and repression that we that we face as individuals and as a people, um, our spirit may be wounded, but if we're pushing through, then our spirit's not broken. And, and so when you see me in in that merch that says "wounded but not broke," broken, it encompasses it encompasses what our 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 struggles in life are. And thank so, you so so much, Sean. You know, thank you, thank you all for having me. Thank you all for uh, being present, being uh, attentive, um, and 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 I wish you nothing but you know the best of health and success in life. Thank I'm you, Sean. Nothing but the best. If you can't tell by now, politicking, uh, we're huge fans of you. You're always welcome back to speak to us anytime, but especially today, we thank you. One note, um, I did not mention, nor did uh, any of us towards the beginning of this program, the actual dates for the mayor election, the preliminary election is scheduled for September 21st and the general election is scheduled for November 2nd. But as you all uh, can see, there's so much going on today that we thought it important to start really digging into this race uh, as soon as possible this spring. And so um, we appreciate our candidates and our panelists, Sean Ellis, who was able to speak now, we'll ask uh, Representative John Santiago and our moderator, Rebecca, to uh, give us a little bit of an idea about what your candidacy is about, uh, Representative Santiago. Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I don't, did Sean Ellis leave by chance? He did just have oh, to go. Oh, I, I wanted a, an opportunity just to thank him for his motivational and inspirational words. I, I, I watched the whole documentary while I was deployed a couple of months ago. I just was on the top of a bunk bed and um, kind of binge watched it. And I think um, it was an important story to tell for sure. And I just wanted a chance to think of, but I'm sure we'll be running uh, uh, crossing paths in the future. So thank you, uh, Black Boston and Politicking uh, for hosting this important event. Uh, it's great to be here with you all and fellow candidates, as uh, Michelle said, I think this might be the first time where we've all come together to partake in uh, this type of discussion. And it's a necessary one, you know, one that we must take a deep dive into, particularly these critical issues impacting the Black community. Because it's not surprising. Uh, in fact, I would say it's entirely predictable um, that we have this tremendous wealth gap that Mayor Janney was discussing, um, that we have a health equity gap, that we have a 30-year life expectancy difference in the state representative district that I currently represent from Copley Square to Nubian Square, 30 years and a 30 minute walk. You know, it's shameful. And um, so the challenges are big and, and they're staring us right in the face. And for me, it's quite personal. You know, I became uh, an ER doctor uh, because my uncle was infected with HIV and later died of AIDS. His only crime was that he was a poor Latino man who couldn't access care. And it was because of that experience, because of living through that injustice, that I committed my life to service. You know, I, from there, I went on to serve my country as a Peace Corps volunteer. You know, I became a captain in the army uh, because I wanted to serve and give back. And if I'm honest with you, it's the reason why I decided to run for office in 2018, because I felt that my patients and my community were not being represented in a manner that was deserving to them. And, you know, after this difficult year of 2020, where, you know, I saw myself doubling my hours in the ER, you know, where I got deployed, like I said, where I came back in December to work that second surge, you know, I decided that in order for Boston to climb out of this crisis, we are going to need strong and bold public leadership. And so I'm running for mayor, not just to bring Boston back stronger than ever, but really to lead us through this crisis and to recovery very much rooted in two things, equity and opportunity. Because I think this moment right now in the city of Boston really transcends politics as usual. It's gonna require a leader. 
and a public servant who's committed to getting things done. And that's what I've done my entire career in public service. And so, you know, what's ultimately going to get us, you know, across the finish line and back to some normalcy is that type of bold leadership. So thank you for the invitation, Black Boston and Politic, and I'm looking forward to um, sitting down with you for the next 15, 20 minutes. Thank you so much, Representative Santiago. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to address the question that I posed uh, to the previous candidate, the questions that we have posed to the previous candidates about addressing the structural inequities that have been revealed by the um, COVID-19 pandemic and the past year of protests in reaction to um, the Black Lives Matter movement and in particular the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Great. Well, thank you. you know, training patients uh, in Boston's busiest emergency department has taught me a lot about the intersection, as you said, of COVID-19, of race and inequity. You know, today we have this dual pandemic um, of coronavirus and systemic racism that has completely taken over our country. Uh, and to be quite honest, that relationship between those both scourges has never been more intertwined, you know. But what's fascinating to me from a public health perspective and the medical perspective is that COVID-19, the actual virus, doesn't really see race or class. It only sees opportunity. And conditions that disproportionately impact Black folks, things like poverty, lack of access to health care, you know, increased air pollution, racism, you name it, that creates the opportunity to wreak havoc. And in medicine, we call those things the social determinants of health. Now, you know, as someone who works in the ER, whether I treat a heart attack, a stroke, COVID-19, a young person who's been shot, those acute issues are actually tied to those social determinants of health. Again, that inequity in black and brown communities in Boston. So how we address structural issues to me is that we need to go, we need to go bold and big on two things. I think we need to empower black communities and we need to provide ownership opportunities. And so as mayor, you know, I wanna be the mayor to really empower black communities by making sure that my administration reflects the community it serves that the black community is engaged with every sector of civil society, that they have access to capital and opportunity. And as mayor, I'm gonna provide ownership opportunities to black communities so they can own more homes, start more businesses, and participate in our economy, because that's how we create wealth. But it's important to me that, you know, we know that we're still in this very acute phase of the, of the pandemic. You know, we still have cases rising across this country. If you look at Michigan right now, they might go in another lockdown. We have cases rising in the city of Boston in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And so as we uh, try to address the acute issue, we need to start planning for the, for the long issue because if I, you know, what I believe is that the real challenge will be the next two, three, four years. And with the hundreds of millions of dollars coming in from the federal government, we are gonna have one heck of an opportunity to reset, to begin to reset, reshape you know, our priorities. Thank you. Um... You touched on this a little bit in response to uh, Sean Ellis's questions, but I want to give you more time to talk about specifically policing and the carceral system in Boston and what your priorities as mayor, priorities as mayor would be. Yeah, I, I think, you know, watching uh, Mr. Ellis's documentary and, and seeing the events unfold from this past week with respect to Patrick Rose, I mean, I'm personally outraged uh, by this breach of public trust and really an abuse of the system. It is shameful. And as a candidate, I quickly called for the release of records, um, which we're still waiting for. But Boston needs to know, you know why he was kept on the job, Patrick Rose, and how that decision was made, because no one is above the law. Um, but I think this speaks to a bigger issue. It's about police accountability. And I have a unique perspective you know, as a person of color myself, as someone who works closely with the BPD on the front lines of the emergency room, but also as a state representative, and as a member of the Black and Latino Caucus that actually got a very piece, a very comprehensive and significant police reform bill done um, just this past year. Now, we established an important post commission. And for those of you who are unaware of what that is, it's an accountability licensure system to make sure that police would be held accountable, just like any licensed profession, if they break public trust. You know, we addressed use of force issues, we prohibited chokeholds, we put restrictions on no-knock warrants, you know. And I'm proud of that work, you know, but police form must continue at the local level. And I'm committed to that. And I think OPAT is a good start, but we can do more. And as mayor, I want to make sure that we are reducing reliance, you know, on police officers in certain situations, which I don't think they have to get involved with, to be frank with you. I think not only will it save us money, but it'll increase morale in the police force. And I want to do this by creating innovative 
and specially designated teams to address what I would argue are more public health issues. You know, and we have cities across this country are doing that. Austin, you know, uh, uh, places in Oregon, and we can do that right here in Mass and in Boston. And so I'm looking forward to having those discussions with activists, with advocates. Um, and so as we plan for a police workforce that better reflects the city of Boston. Thank you. Next, how do you envision an equitable education system for all in the city of Boston? Hello? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, can Sorry. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How do you envision an equitable education system for all in the city of Boston? Great. Well, no, thank you for the question. I think this speaks to the heart of, you know, why I'm running in this campaign. You know, I, I know what it's like to go to an underfunded school. I know what it's like to not even be considered someone who could go to college. I applied to one college the last day possible. No one thought I merited a university uh, admission acceptance. Um, I went through community college. And I ended up at Yale School of Medicine. So I've seen it all. And to me, when I think about BPS students, I think about so much of the lost opportunity that is there. You know, I think about the fact that those kids, I see myself in those kids. You know, the majority of them are poor, they're black and brown. And I'm proud of the work that we've done at the State House. Before COVID-19, my first year in office, I was proud to co-sponsor a progressive legislative effort called the Student Opportunity Act that really fought to achieve um, funding across the entire Commonwealth with respect to you know, how we close this achievement gap. You know, but we have more to do across the Commonwealth, even in Boston particularly. And we'll look at COVID. I mean, with COVID-19, we had such a significant learning loss, the digital divide, the rates and mental health crises that had explode. If you go to my emergency department right now, the pediatric emergency department, that emergency section was in, we had about four or five patients. Now it's triple in size, right? So we have a lot to do to make sure that our most underserved students get the care, the education, and the mental health services that they need. So I think number one, we really have to think creatively how we think about this federal relief coming to Boston, right? You know, I would argue, I would argue that we should divert the majority of that funding to those schools that are most underserved. You know, how we get students back to the classroom as soon as possible by making sure all our teachers are vaccinated. You know, I want to accelerate deferred maintenance and capital improvements to those schools with the highest percentage of low-income students. And really, again, double down on our commitment to mental health services. I want to be the mayor who finally gets us to universal pre-K, right? For me, you know, I think the opportunities in Boston abound, right? We have these world-class institutions, these universities and colleges, and I think they need to play a bigger role with respect to what's happening in the K through 12 system. And I'll give an example. You know, if it wasn't for a five week summer program I did when I was 19 years old that plucked disadvantaged black and brown kids out of school and exposed them to physicians and scientists, you know, I wouldn't be a physician today, right? And I think the synergy that exists between the community, the, you know, the, the science community, the healthcare um, industry, the biotech life science industry in, uh, in, that's going on in Boston right now, they wanna be here for all the competitive advantages that we have here. But making sure they're integrated with our K through 12 system, I see tremendous opportunity in making sure that our kids have the education, the opportunity to succeed. Thank you. I'll ask one last question before giving you some time for closing remarks. How would you seek to ensure that the issue of environmental justice in the city is made a priority? That's that's an excellent question. I think um, I'm very proud of the fact that in the state house we recently passed a bill that addresses this issue. You know, it's a bill that we had to vote on four times because the governor let the time run out the first time. And secondly, he vetoed it, right? And that bill really made up of three primary points. Um, one was it set strict targets for emission standards to get us to net zero by 2050. Um, it increased renewable energy and doubled our wind energy investment. But number three, it finally codified environmental justice. And here in Boston, those of us understand that like no one else, you know, I see it in my patients with higher rates of asthma from Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, East Boston coming to my emergency department. I see it in those same patients who have been doubly hit with the burden of COVID-19. And so for me, it's like, how do we transfer what the state has done to the city of Boston? How do we move quicker? I think there are three things that I wanna focus on as the mayor of Boston. I wanna make sure that our transportation system 
the biggest emitter of greenhouse emissions is dealt with in a way that is comprehensive. I want to install more dedicated bus lanes. I want to have more protected bike lanes. I want to increase the reliability of, of, of transit. And as the only candidate in this race from Beacon Hill who has those relationships with the legislature and the governor, you know, we are best positioned to get it done. You know, I want to see development in the city of Boston move in a more environmentally friendly way. You know, we need to have more transit-oriented development to really bring down our reliance on cars and incentivize public transportation. And I really want to focus on climate resiliency. You know, we have to protect our waterfront and making sure that we accelerate capital investments in that is something I'm committed to do from day one. Thank you. Any last closing remarks before we move on to the next candidate? No, I'm just, uh, you know, excited to be here today as a candidate for the mayor of Boston. I, you know, I really want to thank you all for hosting this important event, you know, and really highlighting the importance of you know, that Black lives do matter, that racism is a public threat. And as someone who's really committed his life to addressing equity issues long before he was a physician or a, a state official, I'm looking forward to continuing that fight as a candidate for the mayor of Boston and hopefully I'll be elected. So I ask for your vote humbly on September 21st. Thank you, Representative Santiago. Uh, we wanna move this program right along. I had the pleasure of speaking to Councillor Campbell uh, some time ago. So she's been hard at work for a long time. I'll let her introduce herself. And of course, our wonderful moderator, Rebecca will be asking her questions, but please Councillor Campbell, uh, you have the floor. Am I on? Yes. And I'll be on for the entire program. First of all, thank you ladies so very much for hosting this incredible event um, and having me this afternoon. Frankly, given what's happening in this country, particularly the police violence uh, and brutality that continues, I do think it's critically important that we continue to make space for these conversations and to talk about racial justice and more importantly, specifically Black Bostonians. So I applaud both Black Boston and politicking for creating this space for each and every one of us. And of course, it's an honor to be on here with all of the other candidates. Um, obviously, I'm Andrea Campbell. What most folks probably don't know is I currently serve as a District 4 Counselor for Dorchester, Mattapan, where I live, a little bit of Jamaica Plain in Rosendale. I have loved serving as a counselor. I've worked with my community in partnership with residents to address our housing crisis, improve our Boston public schools, working on issues of police reform, police accountability, police transparency, criminal legal reform, criminal justice since the very beginning, always with the goal, of course, of ensuring that all of the systems that serve our residents, that those systems are transparent, equitable, and not just equitable and transparent, but also accountable to the residents we have the privilege and the honor of serving in the city of Boston. And I got into this work after pain and loss. And so when Sean was speaking, I will tell you it was quite triggering. Um, it was inspirational, of course, at the same time, because I was born and raised in the city of Boston. I was raised in Roxbury in the South End in a family, frankly, that was torn apart by incarceration and loss, including my own twin brother who would die while in the custody of the Department of Correction as a pretrial detainee when he was only 29 years old. So these issues are deeply personal to me because what I've come to know to be true is that many of the systems that allowed me to be successful in life were the same systems that absolutely failed my twin brother Andre and continue to fail thousands of Bostonians, especially Black Bostonians today. And so this work has always been personal to me and it's always been about breaking cycles of poverty, trauma, criminalization, and inequity. And so for when I jumped into the, the race for city council, challenging a 32-year incumbent, people didn't give me a chance then. Clearly, we were successful. And when I jumped into this race for mayor back in September, um, it was the same driving question, which is how do two twins born and raised in Boston have such different life outcomes? And it's the same message. For me, this is about breaking cycles, generational cycles of poverty, trauma, criminalization. And I'm really happy to be here with you guys to answer your questions and really grateful for the folks who are on the other end who took time to be a part of the conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Campbell. Um, I will repeat our guiding question for today's forum. 
Between the devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and the continuous protests against police violence and systemic racism, events of the past year have truly illuminated structural inequities in Boston and beyond. As mayor, what will you do to protect and uplift the lives of the communities that have suffered most from those inequities? Frankly, it will be continuing what I've been doing to represent District 4. And frankly, District 4, what most people don't know, is one of the poorest districts in the city of Boston. It is predominantly a district of color. So for me, the work has always been about confronting systemic racism in systems and doing the really hard work of eradicating all of the inequities that affect my residents. That wouldn't change. If anything, it would be building on a record of accomplishment that has always been about breaking cycles and generational cycles of inequity. So as mayor, I have no problem confronting systemic racism, but more importantly, advancing policies that are addressed and in, in that address the root causes of these cycles, targeting systems, of course, that have for decades failed Black Bostonians, reimagine and transform them all through a racial equity lens, ensuring that every resident has access to the same opportunity I have been blessed to have growing up in the city of Boston, so for me, that means, of course, ensuring an equitable recovery from COVID-19 by investing thoughtfully in public health systems, overseeing an economic recovery, especially making sure that businesses run by women and people of color and immigrants are supported and get everything they need now in the short term and in the long term to be successful. Absolutely creating more pathways for folks to participate in Boston's economy. And that absolutely includes the folks that Sean was referencing, people who have quarries formerly incarcerated or who have records as well. For me, this also includes expanding access to home ownership. It's all about building wealth, expanding access to capital to close the staggering racial wealth gap in this city that has sadly only gotten worse. I will continue to put forth creative ideas to do that. In addition, ensuring that every single child in the city of Boston has access, access, and access to an excellent Boston public school education. In addition, ensuring that the affordability crisis is addressed so that everyone can afford to live in the city of Boston and stay in the city of Boston. In addition, centering, and this came up before, environmental justice and resiliency in our climate response. This is critically important as we want to improve, of course, the health outcomes of our residents while we're responding to climate and build a green, equitable green economy for our residents as well. And lastly, near and dear, particularly because of what we're seeing in this country right now, continuing to transform our approach to public safety and criminal justice to address the root causes of violence, trauma, and criminalization. All of this work I will do as mayor and it will be building upon the work I've already done as a district counselor. Thank you. Uh, to the last point that you touched on, I wanna give you an opportunity to expand on your priorities regarding specifically policing and the carceral system that Mr. Ellis illuminated earlier in the uh, forum. First of all, I wish he were still here because you know I wanted to tell him that I not only appreciate him sharing his story, which is really powerful, and I appreciate each and every one of you for creating space for him to share his story and his advocacy. You frankly could have just had him on here to ask a question, but you did more than that. And so he is clearly turning his pain into purpose every single day. That means a lot to me, because for me, that's what this work has always been about, turning tremendous pain and loss into purpose. You know, when I was eight months old, my mother died in a car accident going to visit my father who was incarcerated at the time. My father was incarcerated for the first eight years of my life. So my brothers and I didn't meet him until we were eight, bounced around living with relatives, the foster care system, incredible instability. Our father gets out of prison when we are 19 years old. I talked to him one morning, he died that same evening when I was a sophomore at Princeton at the time. My twin brother would go on to also die in the incarceration system when he was only 29 years old. So my life continues to be sort of entangled with the incarceration in criminal justice and policing system, and it has been my entire life. But rather than stay in a place of anger or have that anger turn into resentment, I have turned it into purpose. When I ran for office, it was looking at systems that served me well and asking the question, what did I get? What did I have? And so for me, the 
major topic of policing reform, criminal justice reform, has been a part of my work since the very beginning. I have been leading on these issues as the chair of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice since I joined the council, expanding the Committee on Public Safety to include criminal justice reform, to talk about these issues, not just talking about them, but putting forth bold ideas to solve for these issues. My first budget request as a city councilor was creating the Youth Development Fund, which is now generating millions of dollars for organizations that serve our young people. I have been pushing, of course, in partnership with community for body cameras, fought for that program to be implemented in the city of Boston after the city made a commitment. I said, well, we made a commitment, now let's do it. Pushed, of course, for the creation of the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. And what I was gonna tell Sean, went back and forth with the administration on that legislation. And I agree with him, there was more that could have been put in. I fought and fought. And as a counselor, I didn't win every battle, but as mayor would have included more provisions around data release and records and making sure that when release, releasing information that it's automatically released, that people don't have to file a whole bunch of records requests to get that information. So I will continue to push for transparency in this department. I will continue to push for accountability and for this department to be diverse. And I actually put out a plan that speaks to how I will focus on the root causes of violence, start by doing an open data initiative, which is really important to me. This talks about putting out information automatically on a public facing dashboard. In addition, which is critically important, reallocating a percentage of the overtime budget. People have been talking about this for years. I firmly agree with advocates. The, the police department's budget is over $400 million. An overtime budget of $70 million and it keeps rising. I say take 10% of that $50 million and redirect those resources to the root causes of violence, trauma, mental health, moving people out of poverty. And I'm the only candidate with a plan that is not only sort of practical, a plan to actually get that done. And I think that's critically important if we're gonna solve the issues of violence in the city of Boston because police alone cannot do it. And so I look forward to uh, sharing more about my plan as well. Uh, with the course of the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Our next question um, is, as mayor, what would you set as the number one priority in Boston, in Boston's path to recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic? And if you'd be willing to speak specifically as well on your priorities to ensure health equity for Black Bostonians. Thank you for the question. COVID-19, as we all know, has exposed the longstanding racial inequities and painfully, frankly, revealed just how critically important our health is to every aspect of our lives as individuals, as, in, as also to us as communities. Uh, my first plan actually that I put out was a public health plan. I really encourage folks to look at it because I wanted folks to know that everything I would do as mayor would do it through a public health lens, not just a racial equity lens. And for that mean, for that, for to me, that means making sure that in responding to issues of violence or housing, that we're looking at not just those issues, but all the other social determinants of health, making sure that people have good, good food, making sure they have access to food, good schools, good housing. They're not dealing with air pollution. All of the things that you would need to live a healthy life in the city of Boston. In addition to that, I think one piece of the conversation that often gets sort of left behind is our children. I believe our most important priority to recover from COVID-19 equitably begins with addressing the academic loss and the mental health challenges that our children are facing right now and also doing the really hard work of fixing our Boston public schools. I refuse to let an entire generation of children, our children fall behind because we have not delivered for them an excellent education, which they not only deserve, but are entitled to. And I have been spearheading this work as a city councilor for years. Improving our Boston public schools has been at the forefront of the issues I've focused on. And most recently have filed several hearing orders on this very issue, addressing pieces of my education plan through these conversations, which include of course, addressing the student learning loss that we're seeing, supporting our special needs students, our English learners, making sure that we're implementing universal pre-K and early childcare and education in the city of Boston, all critically important. 
I've been leading on these issues and pushing not just for things in the immediate to happen with respect to learning loss, but for years pushing for the city of Boston to deliver an equitable education to every young person. I put out a plan three years ago. I called it action for Boston children, keyword action, saying that this is the time for us to reform or to transform this system to make sure that every young person has access to an excellent education. And I put that out long before, obviously, I was a candidate for mayor. So as mayor, I would continue to build upon that work and to make sure that our district is transparent and that they're putting our families first as a way to rebuild, frankly, the trust that has been lost with our families. I will also push the district to empower our educators and our teachers with the authority and the resources they need to deliver an excellent education to our children. Make sure that we actually are implementing in realizing universal pre-K for all of our families so they have access to resources and opportunities for their children from birth to five years old, ensuring every child in this city has access to an excellent education from elementary, middle to high school with opportunities to get internships, jobs, college certifications and credits, all of these things and so much more. And frankly, looking at my own life story as a product of BPS, I went to five excellent BPS schools from pre-K all the way through high school and I had excellent opportunities. And for me, it's making sure that every single young person in the city of Boston has the same access to what I had growing up in here. This work is also personal to me. Thank you. I wanna give you the opportunity for any brief closing remarks before we move on to our final two candidates and then the q and I'll just say, this work, and I've been saying this since the beginning, it's not just professional for me always doing the work and being excellent in what I do. It is personal. You know, the question I continue to ask is how do two twins born and raised in Boston have such different life outcomes? It's turning the loss of my twin brother who is near and dear to me into purpose and looking at everything I had in the city of Boston and ensuring that every young person and every other Bostonian has the same. And it's not lost on me that the folks who are bearing the brunt of these inequities are black and brown. And so there's a sense of urgency and purpose. And I think passion, I do smile and laugh, it's not always serious, but purpose and passion in this work to make a difference, to move with a sense of urgency in this work and to not waste any time. So I hope to earn the support of every single person on this Zoom, every Bostonian. And if you wanna learn more, you can visit my website at andreacampbell.org. And I'll be on for the rest of your program. Looking forward to answering any audience questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councillor Campbell, uh, for sharing your story. We'll move right along to uh, our next candidate, who's Chief Barrows. Thank you, Jordan. Good to be here. Um, if you'd like to give any opening introductory remarks, um, and then I can move into our first question. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Black Boston and Politicking for having us here and um, for allowing us to talk to to the community, particularly the Black community. It's critical. Um, you know, I'm born and raised in Boston, born and raised in, in mm -hmm. Roxbury and Dorchester, and I've been an active member of my community all my life. I became a community org organizer at the age of 14 when I used to hear that one out of five Black men was going to end up in uh, the... Uh, criminal legal system or dead. Um, and then it became one out of four and that number kept cre creeping up. Um, so I worked hard. I worked hard to try to change, in fact, that kind of outcome for us in Boston. Uh, eventually, I became the executive director of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, where I worked to invest in the community that had given me so much as a young man by protecting families and elders from housing displacement, building the largest urban land trust in the country, by investing in public health initiatives, safety initiatives, designing and opening new schools in our neighborhood, and then programming for children and youth. So I've been rooted in the community, been rooted in Boston. And as a young black man, you know, it was hard to try to figure out how, you know, I was going to try to, you know, sort of, you know, step in there and make a life for myself because too much around me was negative. But as a community leader, when I moved into to, to trying to improve the, the, the neighborhood and, and my life, it empowered me. So my entire life has been emp about empowering others. So as a small business owner, when we decided, four of us, to open a new restaurant, 
we chose the, the, the Bowdoin Street neighborhood in Dorchester. Not because Bowdoin Street had the most disposable income mm -hmm. for a small business, because Bowdoin Street had the community that we wanted to impact the most. And so we've been excited to be at Bowdoin Street with Restaurant Cesaria, serving the, the neighborhood as the neighborhood supports us and have been supporting us in two, since 2001. As a former community uh, school committee member, I worked hard to make sure that all of Boston students had the best school system that could possibly be given. So that's why we pushed during that time to make sure that the money in our budget was following the children by voting in a student weighted formula in budgeting, making sure that money followed poverty, making sure that money followed English language learner students, making sure that money followed special needs students in our schools. And then as former chief of economic development, I worked hard again to make sure that Boston changed the way that we were growing for strategic growth to continue to grow and not displace our neighborhoods, which is why we pushed hard on affordable housing, making sure that there were opportunities for people to stay. And then we pushed hard on jobs, where we brought more than 140,000 jobs to the city of Boston, having historic lows throughout all of our neighborhoods and a city unemployment rate of 2.4%. So I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about the city, to talk about the importance of the black community in this election and in the city's future. Thank you. Thank you. Without taking up too much time, I'll repose the question. Um, as mayor, what will you do to protect and uplift the lives of the community, individuals and communities who have suffered most from inequities revealed by the COVID-19 pandemic and highlighted from the protests for Black Lives Matter over the past year? So the COVID-19 pandemic brought the, word to, the world to a tipping point. And in our country and in Boston, racial reckoning brought us, you know, hopefully to a point of no return. Um, from this point forward, there should be many things that will never be the same. And we've got to focus, in fact, on making sure that we build a Boston that aspires to for a more just and sustainable future. We need to declare Boston an anti-racist city and then do the work to make it real develop and institutionalize equity and anti-racist goals and standards across all policies and making sure that all systems stop perpetuating disparities. We need to provide legal protections to communities of color against discrimination, bias, harassment. It was clear when, when, when we first got into the COVID pandemic that the communities, communities of color were gonna hit, get hit the worst. Uh, the early numbers showed it. In fact, many of us have lost loved ones. I lost my grandmother the woman who raised me. I lost aunts, uncle, and I'm sure many of us on this call today can say the same thing. These disparities, when they showed up early, we went to Mayor Walsh and we said, we have to create uh, a partnership with the community to begin to deal with. So the mayor appointed a health inequities task force in response to the disproportionate impact and asked me to co-chair it along with the chair, the chief of health and human services, Marty Martinez. We took a hard look at the data and it was, it was once again clear that the same disparities that existed for black and brown people were the same disparities as our social uh, uh, indicators of health uh, that, that had existed for a long time. So then we quickly urged the mayor to declare racism a public health crisis, which he did in April. So we've worked with that framework as a city to dramatically make sure that we've increased testing to the, the, the communities that have been most, uh, most impacted. We made sure that we were providing information and the way we did this was partnering with community uh, 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 partners like local health centers, Black Boston COVID-19 coalition and others. We made sure that people had information in their own languages. We made sure to create accessible vaccination sites close to people by making them mobile, close to public transit. This is the kind of work we need to do because we need to acknowledge the historic racism, the historic mistrust, the valid mistrust of black and brown people towards government, towards healthcare systems, and towards our economic systems. We need to rebuild that trust by making sure that we can address the, the kinds of um, inequities that have lasted for a very, very long time, which includes the inequities that have lasted in our criminal legal system. Um, the criminal legal system is supposed to be there to protect everyone, but it doesn't. The criminal legal system is biased. The outcomes are biased. 
And so police reform is at the heart of that. It's not the only thing we need to do, but it's at the heart of the work that we must do as a city to make sure that uh, our folks, that, that make sure that the legal system is working for all of us. So I was proud to ask the mayor to stand up the police reform uh, task force that came out with recommendations that we immediately accepted to implement fully the body, the, the police body cam camera um, um, recommendations and then also the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. That kind of work needs to continue. We need to push forward on it in a way that eradicates all of the, the, the biases in our system, our, legal, our criminal legal system. But we also make, need to make sure that all of the work that OPAT is um, transparent, that information comes out. And I'm hoping that we have information on the Rose case, at least by this Tuesday. So everybody knows what's happened, what the investigation says, and then what we need to do to move forward. Without that kind of trust, without that kind of transparency, the police is not going to be effective in doing their work. It's critical, in fact, that that happens on an ongoing basis, not just when we need it. And then the last piece, and I'll, you'll probably ask me a question about it, so I won't spend too much time, but if we're talking about racism and er eradicating racism, we got to be talking about housing and economic development at the same time. Because in fact, that is a determinant on people's health, determinant on people's academic success. And it's something that I've got a long record on, but we've got to actually lean in on and do more. Affordable housing is critical. When we did the work in the neighborhood looking at our schools, we found that about 20% of the young people, the children in, in schools in our neighborhood were inadequately or instably housed. That can't be. A child can't be asked to go to school and do work and, 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 and have academic success if, in fact, they don't have stable housing, if their parents aren't at work, if we don't have economic uh, sustainability. So that's all the kind of work that I would do as mayor to make sure that we address the inequities in health and the inequities coming out of our racist past and racist existing institutions. Thank you. You touched on policing the carceral system and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I do want to uh, give you the opportunity to talk in more in depth about how you envision an equitable education system for all in the city of Boston. Yeah, education is key. I, I, I'm, you know, my parents came from the islands of Cabo Verde. Uh, they were immigrants and my father would always say, you know, John, the opportunity we came here for was schooling. It was education. Quality education is critical for the future of all of our residents and family, everybody in the entire city. Developing a more seamless birth to career education pipeline that guarantees access, high quality education and training is gonna be a major priority for me. That's why I spent time on the school committee. That's why I spent time doing it in our neighborhood. Um, prioritizing public education is one of the most powerful way we can address inequities and become a more equitable, just city. In fact, as a longtime community organizer, I helped to create new schools, such as the or Orchard Garden Pilot School. I remember sitting down um, in a community meeting where Edna Bino came in, and as, a, as a, the, the city was talking about developing an Orchard, Orchard Park at the time, Edna said, no, 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 we're going to save this pot right here for a new school, because the only way we can anchor uh, strength in our community, we can anchor future leaders in our community, we can address some of the inequities, is to make sure that people have quality education. Edna died. She was a she was a she was a, a mentor of mine, and I got together with uh, her sister and others, and we put in an application for that school, and then created and opened the Orchard Garden Pilot School. We put in an application for the Dudley Street Neighborhood School as well to to help to create schools that were supporting our families so they can be supportive of their children, and to put schools at the center of community so that we can all wrap around schools and our families to do that work. So it is important that students have. Uh, funding, funding equity, that regardless of whatever schools they go to, that they have the same resources and for the schools that have more social issues, that they have more resources. So that's why as school committee member, I fought for that. School empowerment is also important that we have autonomy so that the schools can work with their parents and their students to give them what they need. It's critical. So as mayor, I would increase investment in public education uh, with a major emphasis on the opportunity gap that exists for low-income families, for families of color, for Black families, for English language learners, for students with disability. And I would increase in and out of school supports for students experiencing homelessness and trauma specifically. We would develop a seamless birth to career education pathway because I mean, even a study that came out of Indianapolis of the, uh, um, their um, Federal, Federal Reserve uh, uh, study showed that for every dollar you spend, between birth to five, you will save $17 on remedial support work later. 
in their teenage years. This is a place of huge investment and something that Boston needs to invest in now. And in fact, when you start to think about some of the federal money that's coming to our city, we should go big on birth to five. And then we need to make sure that there are more quality school pathways uh, that address uh, pathways to career and make sure that people have internships, externships, apprenticeships, because we have a booming economy that can provide all of those opportunities. But if our students can't be, uh, begin to touch that, see that, or build the skills to get there, we've left them, we've left them um, behind an eight ball in it. And we've got to make sure that we provide that for our students so that we can close the gap and get them ready for careers in Boston. Thank you. Lastly, I'll give you uh, time for any brief last closing remarks. You know, so, you know, the closing remark for me is first, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, for the work that you guys are doing. I want to thank everybody who got on the call uh, to listen and be part of this conversation. Um, I want to give a shout out to my nine year old son. Um, I think you might have heard his brother walk in the room while I was trying to answer my question here, uh, trying to throw me off. Uh, but they're, they're eagerly waiting for me to step into the next room and, and cut his uh, cut his cake. Uh, but uh, I told him that this is about the future of the city. This is about the future of black boys like him. It's about the future of black girls. This is, we're doing this to make sure that he can cut a lot of cakes uh, because we know the threats of 13 year olds. Uh, we know the threats of nine, nine year olds that look like him and we've got to change the world. So that's never the case. I shouldn't be having that conversation with my son on his nine year old birthday. I shouldn't be having a conversation about how he protects himself. Shouldn't be telling him stories about me being, you know, um, abused by police in different occasions. Um, my story is written in, in a book called Streets of Hope, well documented. Um, we can't have that. We've got to have a city that is more supportive of all of our children, all of our residents. And let me tell you, the American racist system is an anti-Black system. It's an anti-Black system from the core, from the foundation of this country that we've got to eradicate. And that means we need to rethink new systems and we need to rethink the way that we engage and the way that we see each other because some of us aren't seen or valued. And so I was, I was really excited to hear my brother Sean on this call as he talked about his push, as he tries to uh, uh, elevate the plight of those who are innocent and caught in our, in our, in our legal system. Um, that's the kind of work we need to do to see people, to value people. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing that now with a couple of brothers who are innocent and are trying to fight their charges. And there's so many of them out there. So I want to answer to his question specifically. He had asked if as mayor, if we would commit to sitting with innocence projects. And I want to commit here to sitting with innocence projects, the directors, to sit with families, mm -hmm. to sit with innocent uh, felons to make sure that in fact that we are pushing to improve the, the system, but to get to justice today for so many, so many of us that have been wronged uh, uh, because of our, the color of our, sin, uh, of our skin, and that's not right. And so as mayor, uh, understand that racism and eradicating racism is job one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Barrows. We want to remind our candidates, I know you have to go and enjoy uh, your son's birthday, but for those who are able to stick around, we are going to ask just a few audience questions. We'll do that after our last candidate, Counselor George. And I just want to, you know, operate in transparency by letting you all know we're running a little bit behind program, but we'll end no later than 410. It's a promise. Counselor George, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and we'll give you uh, the final slot to speak about your candidacy in this very important race. No, thank you very much, uh, Jordan. And I'm excited to be with all of you. I'm sorry that I was a few minutes late to turn on my uh, camera. I was running late from one of my boys football games and I would uh, love to see, you know, you know, Mr. Ellis mentioned his love for perhaps coaching football and I'd love to see his passion. I hope he has the skills to match his passion for coaching. I would love to talk about that as uh, someone who thinks athletics and um, a community and youth programming is really important, especially for our young boys and having to be the mother of four teenagers. I'm running because Boston is my home. I have deep roots here and a connection that drives me to work harder and deliver more for the city I love. I believe I am the right leader for this city at this moment. As a small business owner, I know how devastating this pandemic has been on our businesses, large and small. 
and what it's going to take to recover, to grow and thrive. As a former Boston Public Schools teacher, I had a front row seat to the challenges that our families face day in and day out. We need to lift up our students, our educators, our schools, our school communities to close the achievement gap and make sure every child receives a great education. As an at-large city councilor, I represent the entire city and while I'm proud of my legislative accomplishments in housing and homelessness, mental health, recovery and education, I'm most proud of my presence in all of our neighborhoods. I'm most proud of showing up and then following through to do the work. As a mother of four teenage boys, I know what it's like being a mom, being uh, faced with um, the, the concerns of the night, the concerns of our schools, the concerns of our communities, and what it's like to just get the work done for the family. We can't just recover from COVID. We have a responsibility and an opportunity to reimagine, to re-engage, and to rebuild a more equitable, better Boston. And to do this right, it's going to take that hard work, and I'm ready for that challenge. And as your mayor, I will be present and accessible on the ground and in all of our neighborhoods to hear firsthand your stories, struggles, and successes, to uplift those voices and let your voices, your experiences, inform the work and drive the agenda. And then bring us together to have those tough but necessary conversations to, do be to better understand each other and to collaborate to find real solutions. It's what I've done as a counselor. That's what I'll continue to do as your mayor. I will continue to bring my experiences from the city council and the work I've done on the city council to the mayor's office. But most importantly, I'll bring yours. We have a lot of work to do. I will take each and every one of us to create a stronger, more just and more inclusive Boston. Thank you to Black Boston and Politicking for welcoming me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have this discussion. And I believe uh, to my core, as important as it is to have the experts in any of the fields and any of the topics that we'll discuss, it's really important to have the regular voices of the people just chipping away at the work every single day at the table. So I'm grateful to be here with all of you. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Rebecca and everyone else. And uh, it is wonderful. I think as Michelle mentioned earlier uh, in the, the comments that we're all here together and very special, uh, special to see you all. Thank you for being here, Counselor. Uh, you mentioned that you were the most qualified person uh, to serve as the city's next mayor. And so I'd like to know if, given that opportunity, what you'll do to protect and uplift the lives of Black Bostonians and other communities that have suffered most from the inequities highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic and, of course, by recent protests against police killings. Yep, no, certainly um, in everything that Boston does, we have a responsibility to be intentional when combating and dismantling racism. And we need to do the work that demonstrates, not just says, but demonstrates that Black Lives Matter. We have to call it out for what it is and where it is. And we need to make sure that we can see it in order to dismantle it because we know it's everywhere. And that's why we call it systemic. It of course is in our education system and in our justice system. But we also know that those inequities exist in our transportation system and our housing system and our park system. Yes, it's even where we, when we discuss and how we decide how to fill potholes. There is so much work to do, including closing the racial gap, which we've all talked about today, increasing access to improved high quality transportation, creating more pathways to home ownership, to increase access to capital so that entrepreneurs can build businesses. And, and I know in the chat, there were some questions around creating more opportunities for local businesses to start and grow and, and bloom and flourish. We also need to institute police reforms. We need to improve air quality. We need to take care of contaminated land across our city. And we need to make sure that we're helping all of those who have disproportionately been impacted by this pandemic. I believe to best tackle racism and inequities, we must surround each other. We must be surrounded ourselves by those who have those lived experiences. And, and I've worked to have them alongside of me to inform and guide the work. I will make my cabinet and my administration reflective of all the communities in Boston and to ensure the diversity of this great city is reflected in the leadership that I surround myself with. Certainly, we cannot do this work alone, and I believe that as a convener and a collaborator, I don't do this alone. I can only work through my own lens. That's why it's so important to truly make progress. We need to bring people together and have difficult conversations to get the work done. Thank you for the question.
And thank you, Counselor. You know, I want to talk about uh, the issue of environmental justice. We saw President Biden, uh, not even a week into office, prioritize environmental justice and environmentalism, uh, generally speaking. And, you know, politicking's ethos is that um, while it's important who's in the White House, everything, especially the issue of environmentalism, doesn't start and end with what happens at 1600 Pennsylvania. And so perhaps in partnership with the White House, but certainly as mayor, how would you prioritize environmental justice, injustice, which continues to disproportionately impact Black Bostonians, frankly speaking? Well, I think, you know, often when we talk about environmental injustice um, and the desire to create real climate justice in our city, you know, I, I'm going to answer that question specifically, but I think it's so important to note that it is intertwined with all of the other injustices that we see across our system, as I mentioned in the previous question, you know, around educational injustice, transportation injustice, eco economic or lack of economic opportunity, how those injustices across the system, across all of our sectors, really play into uh, the lack of opportunity and uh, lack of true environmental justice here in the city of Boston. And it doesn't start at 1600. I'd say, if anything, 1600 uh, Pennsylvania Ave should just be uplifting the work that's happening, whether it's in 02125 or 02121 or 02119 across all of our cities. It starts in, across all of our neighborhoods. It starts in our city. It starts in our city and in our communities and our neighborhoods. Um, and for sure, the impacts of climate change are very, very real here in Boston. And while climate action is definitely about emissions and building greener buildings, it's also just about being honest around the conversations and who's leading those conversations. I think we have to be really honest that all too often we're focused on the issues of climate and environmental justice because white well-off advocates have said this is what we need to be talking about. We need to make sure that this conversation is happening in our communities because the problems are being the, the brunt of the challenge. The brunt of environmental injustice is done on the backs of our communities of color, on the backs of our black communities, on the backs of our poor communities. We know that this city is disproportionately impacted by climate. And our climate actions must begin with the frontline communities whose health and self safety is most at risk. That means taking very proactive steps in our communities. And some of the things that we would need to be working on and double down on, because Boston, as much as we are still behind, has been the leader when we think about environmental justice and, and resiliency. We need to make sure that we're mitigating how air pollution affects residents living under flight patterns. When I was teaching at East Boston High School, I was also coaching in their summer program in a field that we practiced on at Constitution Beach. We'd spend the day looking at the ass end of airplanes. And then when we wonder why East Boston has such poor air quality and such high rates of asthma, we looked at it, we were looking at it as I was coaching six, seven and eight year old girls on how to hit a, hit a softball and pitch a, pitch a fastball. Protecting our coastal environments from sea level rise and flooding is also important. Michelle mentioned Morrissey Boulevard. It floods all of the time. We've got to be better prepared for this. And we need to, as, as an, another one of my colleagues mentioned, make sure that we are investing in some real capital improvements uh, to shore up our shoreline and recognizing that our shoreline extends beyond downtown Boston and just our inner harbor. We need to make sure that we're also improving public transit and encourage ridership and re to reduce greenhouse emissions and grow our tree, tree canopy. The Boston City Council has been really engaged in that work and we've been working in partnership with the administration to not just measure our tree canopy, but look for ways to grow it. On the city council, I've been a strong advocate for increasing efficiency in our Boston public schools. Um, and our Boston public schools make up the majority of our city owned buildings. We have a real opportunity to do the work there. I've also led the fight for expanding clean energy job opportunities through Madison Park Vocational Education High School. And as mayor, I'm going to continue this work and take a community-based approach to fight environmental just injustices and lead and deliver on climate action and start where we can do it. And that's at home, that's in our neighborhoods, that's with our city assets, and then grow it from there. Thank you very much for that question. Absolutely. My last question for you is on the matter of housing inequity. You know, it's not hyperbole to say that the city of Boston is facing a housing crisis. It's a fact. In fact, um, 
it takes 5.2 years of median income to buy a moderately priced house in the city. And so what's your priority to tackle this issue as it's very clearly stated, uh, it impacts so many Bostonians as we speak. How, the cost of housing here in the city of Boston is too expensive for too many families and it touches all Bostonians for sure. And if we want our city to grow and thrive, I certainly do, we need to directly address the cost of affordable housing. And for me on the Boston City Council, I've led the way talking about our families experiencing homelessness, the 5,000 students in the Boston Public Schools who are experiencing homelessness and the work that we need to do to support those children and their families. We worked in partnership with the administration to make sure that we had a pilot program in place with the six and seven most um, uh, schools with the most students experiencing homelessness, homelessness, although across all of our schools, every 125 buildings in the Boston public schools, we have students experiencing homelessness. We worked on a pilot in partnership and collaboration to make sure that there were, house, there were housing stabilization programs available, that there was rent relief available, and that there was housing available. And we did that in partnership both with, with city departments, with nonprofit organizations, and private uh, developers across our city. That program is now growing to meet the needs of students in 18 schools. And over this last year, with Mayor Walsh, I started and, and we formed, um, passed an ordinance in partnership with my colleagues on the city council. We passed a special ordinance to form a special committee to end family homelessness here in the city of Boston. I've worked over the last four and a half years or so with shelter providers, families with lived experiences, and those doing the work on the front lines to make sure that we are responding to the needs of our families across the city and those that are most vulnerable, those that are in our sh shelters, whether it be congregate or scattered sites, whether it be our hotels and our motels, and working in partnership with our school system in particular to make sure that we're responding to their needs and helping our families find housing across and in our city and, and ideally close to school because school becomes the, the cornerstone for so much of what our kids um, rely on and need. Uh, and, and I look forward to continuing that work and doing that work in partnership with our friends at the State House because the state plays such an important role in both answering the, the needs of our families experiencing homelessness, but creating a better pipeline to more housing across our city that is more affordable and more, more affordable, especially as it relates to our families. Absolutely. I'd like to offer just a moment to you, Councillor George, um, and I would like to open the floor following your last statement to those of you who are remaining to audience questions, but I'd love for you to share any closing remarks. Yeah, no, thank you. And I know that we're coming up against the four o'clock hour, so I'll be brief. I'm just grateful for this opportunity to be in a community, virtual community with all of you to share a little bit about myself, to introduce myself. Um, to your audience, to those that are viewing right now and who will likely uh, review the video. I'm grateful to talk about my work on the council and uh, my hopes as mayor of the city of Boston. But I also want you to know at this moment in time as a sitting city councilor at large representing the entire city of Boston, we don't wait and hold on to good ideas until after I'm elected mayor. The work continues today and the work continues every day. So as these conversations continue, as we participate in forums, as we have conversations about our schools, as we have conversations about our neighborhoods, as we have conversations about public health and public safety and community, that that work continues on the city council every day. And I'm committed to that responsibility. I'm committed to that, that uh, the vote that I received uh, to continue that work in 2019. And I look forward to doing it and continuing that, um, that legacy as mayor of this great city. I hope to have your support. I hope to have your vote in both the preliminary and final election, September and November. And I hope that you'll check me out at anisa4boston.com. And just as a reminder, uh, my name is Anisa Asaibi George and very proud to serve as an at-large city council and look forward to serving as your mayor. Thank you very much. It sounds like you've got someone cheering you on in the back. <laughs> just just my COVID, my COVID puppy Astro. <laughs> Thank we you. Came so for a visit earlier. Yeah, it sounds like he was giving you a word of support. Okay. Thank you in all seriousness. We're gonna move on to two audience questions, and those that don't get answered 
we'll be happy to share with our candidates via email and follow up with everyone uh, who's attending to ensure that everyone's response is fulfilled. But the first question that I'd like to ask uh, is from Jarrett Jones. He asks, what can be done to remedy the inequities surrounded liquor licensing in Boston, Massachusetts? Who will go to work in the state house and remove the state imposed liquor license cap having only eight black full service restaurants liquor licensed in Boston is shameful. Eight out of 1400 here are quite literally more than that on a single block. Who will take that fight to Governor Baker? Who will do the right thing and not cave to restaurant owners looking to cash out on their liquor licenses? I'm happy to give a, a quick response to that question. And you know, we've we've done a lot of work on the city council. We did it formally um, in partnership with former council, now Congresswoman Presley on this issue. She was a champion in making sure that more communities, especially our communities of color and our business owners of color had access to these licenses. Um, I would say all of us likely are very interested in this work, but one word of caution, as we are still in the midst of this pandemic, so many of our business owners, our restaurants, our bars, our establishments are suffering, are in a great deal of pain. So we do need to tread carefully and thoughtfully and with very specific intention and in making sure as we look to create uh, more licenses that are easier to access and help support businesses to open. Um, we've got to be very careful about the implications that has for our, especially our locally owned businesses now across our city and in our neighborhoods. And, and I'll just add, Jordan, I, I don't know if you were going to another question. You know, I put out a, I put out a restaurant plan and I would encourage, um, I, I didn't hear the name of the individual who asked the question um, to check it out because this has been a topic of discussion, frankly, for far too long in the city. And it absolutely needs fierce advocacy. I currently live in Mattapan. Mattapan is one of my districts. There is not a restaurant that you can sit down in that has um, an actual uh, liquor license. And that's ridiculous. And I think that example speaks to the inequities that currently exist in the city of Boston. Um, so would love to continue this conversation offline, but I've put out some ideas already on whether it's a tiered uh, fee structure. There are different ways in which to make them more accessible and available to folks. And frankly, some of the restaurant owners that were referenced, um, larger owners also see these inequities and see it as a problem and want to be a part of the solution. So I, if it was Jared or whoever has the question, um, would love to continue this conversation um, post this uh, convening. So Jordan, this is something that I've been working on for a very long time. There is in fact a bill at the state right now that it introduces a new type of licenses, a new type of liquor licenses, neighborhood-based liquor licenses that are dedicated to different neighborhoods. It doesn't undercut the existing licenses in the market. It doesn't undercut the existing uh, restaurants. What would happen is uh, if this bill were to pass as it is now uh, 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 written, it would allow for Mattapan as an example, because the counselors write zero uh, liquor licenses in Mattapan it would allow Mattapan to get five liquor licenses for the next three years, five liquor licenses that would sit on a shelf for Mattapan. And so these would be liquor licenses that would not go out to the market. They would then go back to the city if, the, if, if somebody was to close their, their, their uh, restaurant. So they would be sold at an administrative rate, not 400,000, not 250,000. They would be provided to those restaurants at about $3,000, which is an administrative rate. Uh, and then the restaurant would be incentivized to open a full service restaurant. We've got to take, we've got to take uh, bold action if we're going to address some of the inequities that exist in our economy. Right now, we need the courage of folks at the state house to pass this bill. It's there, it's a new set of licenses. It doesn't hurt anybody, but it does help our community create businesses. Let, let, me, let me just add to that. Listen, I think we all feel similarly when it comes to liquor licenses across the city of Boston. We all want to support black businesses. We all want to increase the number of licenses. The question is, how are we going to get it done? And who has the relationships in the legislature to get it done? You know, as the only candidate from Beacon Hill, I have those relationships. You know, we've had a slew of endorsements from Beacon Hill, powerful people up there who know me, who trust me, who want to work with me, who want to get this type done. So if you want an advocate for you at the state house, then that's my candidacy. I have to run at 4 p.m. I have to go pick up uh, my wife. I apologize. Thanks for everyone uh, for allowing me to jump on this conversation. We'll see you on the campaign trail. Thank you, Representative.
uh, the very last question that I'd love for everyone uh, who's able to stay and to answer is actually something extremely important. So thank you for asking this. This week it was revealed that a Boston police officer who bragged about running down protesters this summer is now back on duty. What messages are being sent by BPD to residents in Boston when their officers who've demonstrated hateful and violent behavior towards us? And how do you as mayor plan on holding these officers and this city accountable and breaking this cycle or rewarding police misconduct, no particular order and how you all would like to answer this? I'll start. Um, I think that it's so important that we have a much more transparent and much more accountable system in place. We have to do that. And we've seen that certainly nationally, but here in the city of Boston, the, the calls for transparency and accountability have been screened from the rooftops. We now just have to get to that work. Um, with the appointment this week of the, the executive director of OPAT, I hope that we will see some of that action take place. Um, without delay. And I'm excited about that appointment and excited about doing that work, certainly in collaboration between the council and the mayor's office today and in the future. I'll, number one, he should be fired. Clear as that. And I think it is important that the leaders in this city name that explicitly. Yes, there's always due process. I'm a lawyer. I understand that. There's due process fought for the Office of Accountability and Transparency to, to be set up for due process. That video came out some time ago. There should have been an investigation and we should now know what the decision is. And frankly, it should be that he should be fired. Um, and I think we need to be explicit on that because if we are not, we're going to continue to have a department that is not in good relationship with community where trust continues to be eroded. And if we know anything about effective policing, particularly based on what's happening nationally, and we don't need another report from the Department of Justice, trust is critically important. And how do you build trust, especially with communities of color? How do you build trust with people who continue to not only see the inequities in the system in this department, but who are also harmed and killed by this system. It is transparency and it is accountability and a swift response. So whether it's that case or the recent Rose case involving child molestation, residents need to see swift response. They need to know where their leaders are. They need to of course see transparency done quickly and then accountability. Um, and I think frankly, it's a shame that the department needed some external media report um, and frankly, that's how I learned that he was even back on the job through something external, which is ridiculous, um, for them to then put him out uh, to then do this investigation. And so I would do it differently. I have continued to say transparency and accountability and swiftly. Um, and, and we have to be unwavering in that. And I just, I can't say that enough. It has to be unwavering and it has to be swift because if not, the trust will continue to erode with this department. Um, and that's a major concern, not only for residents and their safety, but also for the officers who are doing the right thing every single day to serve and protect all of us. Look, I'm gonna jump in and, and, and disagree. We cannot just learn that he's back on and nobody knew what happened be between the time that we heard about the incident and then today. That, that, that shouldn't happen. This should be a process. We should know what happened. We should know what the investigation was. We should know what the investigation said. We should know what the determination is and why the determination was made in a way for us to make sure that our police are in fact doing what they need to do. Because look, we, we're eroding trust. And, and the council said it without trust, we can't have a police uh, department that functions. It's, the, it's in the best interest of the police to make sure that this is transparent. It's in the best interest of the police to make sure that we know exactly the steps that we're taking and why he's back on. All I know is he said he was, I mean, he said he 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 run ran down some folks, made it a light light of it and on video, and then he's back on. Not good. Not good public process, not a good way to run a city. We've got to do better than that. We owe that to our city and we owe that to everybody on the police force to make sure that there is zero tolerance for any kind of behavior like this. Powerful words from you all. I wanna thank you again. I am going to turn this program over to my co-founder, Wen Cooney, and then ultimately back to Rebecca to give some last words from Black Boston. On a personal note, I'm inspired by each one of you and quite frankly, uh, your selflessness to step up and really put yourself out there uh, to figure out how you might serve the city through this very unprecedented time. 
Uh, I want to thank all of you all who attended this program again for joining and spending your Saturday afternoon. You could be at brunch or wherever else, and maybe you are, uh, but you really took some time to learn about the important details of this race. Lastly, I want to remind everyone that the general election is November 3rd. So much will happen in between then. I'm sure you'll have an opportunity to hear from the candidates more but we're so glad to have given you the opportunity to speak about improving Black life in Boston with us today. So thank you again. And happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday. birthday, happy birthday. <laughs> Jordan, such a fantastic job moderating. And we again want to thank every single one of the candidates who participated, as well as Sean, who had to go. Um, such, a, such a pivotal time in Boston. 46% um, of voters are saying that they're still undecided in this race. And a lot can change before September 21st, which we know is when your primaries are. And so we're looking forward to having you guys back. If you guys haven't come on to politicking individually, we're extending that invitation now. Please follow up with us. We'd love to have you and continue to speak with each of your campaigns as September approaches. We encourage everyone to download politicking in the Android and Apple stores. Um, and follow our work online at Politicking. Um, this, it has been recorded, it will be posted. Please feel free to share it. Please feel free to share the clips. Um, we so enjoyed having you on today and I'll turn it over to Black Boston, Rebecca. Yes, thank you so much. Echoing Jordan and Wen Cooney's remarks, thank you so much to the candidates, to Sean Ellis, and to uh, all the attendees of today's panel. We really appreciate this opportunity. Um, we will be continually working on the guide that we've put together, um, keeping people updated. Uh, as Jordan said, you will hear from all the candidates, but we're so grateful that today uh, we have the opportunity to ask you all these very important questions. You can connect with Black Boston. We're at Black Boston at Black Boston 2020 on all social media and blackboston.org is our website. Um, so you on all those channels, you can keep up with us as we continue our struggle to build community, educational upliftment and political engagement among Black Bostonians. And with that, be safe, everyone. Please, please stay safe. Please, um, you know, just find out as much as you can through our outlets and continue to look out for more opportunities to learn about this race and other aspects of government at every level. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a nice afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thank you, ladies. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Next time we need to have a DJ for the um, intro and outro. <laughs> outro, absolutely. Yeah, I was we need that. that. So much did it too. <laughs> that would be that would have been love. We gotta we gotta get some Boston. Maybe we can get Benzino on here next time, Jordan. Maybe. <laughs> He's a hometown hero. My god sister knows him, so yes, why not? We'll get, we'll get Benzino Chris, to do rock Chris the party. Knows him. Well, Chris has met him. We'll get him to do Rock the Party as an intro. <laughs> get everybody hyped. All <laughs> right. So folks. Well, I see everyone's already hopping off. Yep, 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 yep. All righty. Shout out to Karen from Wilson. I see you, Mom. We had a great turnout. Very blessed. So um, I will follow up with everyone. I uh, definitely want to have some touch points for our wonderful attendees. I know that we've got an updated policy guide to share. I definitely do want to give candidates an opportunity to answer any questions uh, that didn't get touched on, but this is great. I mean, um, it, it's, a, it's really a miracle that we got this conversation within that two hour slot ish. Absolutely, absolutely. We're blessed. Um, I think we did great on time. Uh, everybody showed up on time, so we couldn't have asked for going any smoother. And Rebecca, thank you so much for holding down the fort. Um, I know Alex had to jump off, but thank her for us too. 
Yes. I was like, Re Rebecca need a breath. She, I was like, Rebecca is like person after person, just going ham. Awesome. So should we hop off, Jordan? I'm gonna hit you up because I know we're gonna record a little later. Yeah. Um, what time do you want to go? Um, I think we could take like an hour. Send me the topics, uh, maybe like five fifteen. I'd be fine. That works. All right then. Everyone, take care. Stay positive, or yeah, stay positive. Test negative. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye, bye, guys. Take care, ladies. Bye.